Hi there guys, nice to see you all again. Mr. Martin here, thank you so much for joining me. Now today, what we're gonna be exploring is another approach into studying memory, this time the cognitive approach. Now because memory is very much a cognitive discipline, we have a lot to say in terms of the cognitive approach in memory. So in this very short video, we'll just be doing the absolute basics. Later videos, we'll be looking at more specific ideas of cognitive memory. But let's begin uh, with a very short bit of revision. If we think in terms of cognitive psychology, remember, a cognitive psychologist views the mind as being more like a computer than anything else. And moreover, a cognitive psychologist would understand all psychology concepts and ideas to be explainable in terms of input, process and output. So let's apply cognitive psychology to memory for a second. If we think in terms of output to start with, the whole idea of memory is to be able to retrieve it, to be able to bring it to the front of your mind, to recall it, to act upon it, to influence your new experiences, whatever else it might be. So in terms of a computer, you could maybe equate your long-term memory to your computer's hard drive. That's actually how you store files and information and whatever else it might be actually on your computer's memory. So the long-term system might be explainable in terms of a hard drive. Short-term memory, a little bit more difficult to pin down, a bit more of a nebulous idea this one. However, we might explain the short-term memory in terms of your computer's processor. So for example, if you double click on an icon on your computer or you tap an app on your phone screen or your iPad screen, the processor inside your device has to think about it, it has to process it and then do something with it. Short term memory does the same thing for you. You give it something to think about, the short term memory might rehearse it, manipulate it, might do various things to it and then hopefully pass it into long term memory. So the short term memory could be comparable to your computer's processor. One of the benefits about using cognitive approach into studying memory is that we can build what are called memory models out of this. And we won't explore memory models too much in this video. We'll save it for a future one because there's a lot to say about them. But basically a memory model is a framework for understanding what memory can do and ultimately how it works. We couldn't do that in any of the other approaches. So that's one of the biggest benefits of using the cognitive approach to explain memory. The biggest area of uh, research into the cognitive approach into memory is in this idea here, schema. Now, schemas are a little bit difficult to define. My understanding of this is a schema is a set of ideas and beliefs about something. So, for example, I'll ask you just now to picture in your mind a restaurant. What you're probably imagining is sitting at a table. There may or may not be a tablecloth there. There's definitely going to be cutlery, a knife on your left and a fork on your right. There's maybe a drink on the table, maybe a bottle of wine. Food down in front of you, there's probably waiters bustling around. There's probably a number of other people sitting there. What you're imagining inside your head just now is your schema for a restaurant. It's your set of ideas and beliefs. You have this idea of what a restaurant should look like. So that's how your mind constructs it inside your head. A schema is very much influenced by prior experience and culture. So, for example, as a child, the, before you'd even been to a restaurant with your parents, you probably had no idea what one was. First time you go, you have more of an idea and it's built upon thereafter. It's also influenced by culture. For example, if we were to do the same idea, picture a restaurant, but we were in Japan, you probably have a different idea. It's very common in Japan to be asked to, uh, to kneel at the table uh, except instead of uh, sitting at a chair. It's also very unlikely you'd have a knife and fork, you'd probably have chopsticks instead. So you can see here how culture might influence your schema as well, so they can change. A very good psychologist in the early 90s called Cohen does a really nice little experiment here. Basically what he asked people to do is to picture a picnic and to write down their ideas. And what he finds is that people that have never met, people that are completely apart from each other, all more or less picture the same idea. They all have this wicker basket that you can see. It's always a red and white gingham cloth that's on the ground and you're always in some kind of lovely meadow somewhere. There's sandwiches there, there's probably fruit, these kind of things as well. How many of you have actually ever been at a picnic that looks like that? 
probably not many of you. So you can see here how our idea of culture and experience also influences our schema. If I ask you to picture a picnic, this is probably the scene that you pictured, even though you've never probably been a picnic like that. Coincidentally, in the same year, another group of psychologists, French and Richards this time, also do a nice little experiment. They ask people to look at a clock that looks not dissimilar to this one, then to turn away from it and to draw it. And what they do is quite interesting. They do XII for 12, I, II for 2, III for 3, and then for 4, they draw IV. There's no clock, well, hardly any clocks in the world that have IV for four. They normally have I, 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 I. Now, this is not Roman numerals, obviously, but that's just how clockmakers have always done it. But because the participants have a schema about Roman numerals inside their head, they just assume that on a clock, it's going to fit their schema for Roman numerals. So they draw IV instead of I, 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 I. Quite interesting, nonetheless. Key study in this area that explores the use of schema is this one here, Brewer and Trains, 1981. It's a study they call a study of schemas in memory. Basically, they're looking here to figure out whether people will conform to their schema inside their head or whether or not they notice things which don't quite fit their schema. So what they do is they ask their participants to wait in an office. Now, in reality, this office has been specially designed by Brewer and Trains. What they do is they fill the office with items which do fit the office schema. So there's a typewriter that you can see there. There's a desk, there's paperwork, there's folders, all these sort of things. There's a, a clipboard here, those, a, a, a pin board rather, these sort of things. And they also fill it with items which did not fit the office schema. So things that you would never normally expect to see in an office. For example, there was a brick there, I can't quite see on this picture. There's a human brain, there's a skull, there's, there's a bottle of wine, there's various other things there um, as well. After roughly a minute and a half, the participants are taken out of the room and they're asked, what did you see in that office? Write down on the sheet all the different things that you saw. What Brewer and Trainers find is quite interesting. The participants report seeing the items which fit the office schema. So they note down typewriter, they note down folder, they note down pinboard, and then they start noting down some other things. They note down book, they note down um, shelves, they note down uh, a bookcase, they note down uh, various different things which were not in the room whatsoever. So what's happening here is the participant's schema is somehow influencing what the participants actually saw. Even if they didn't see it in real life, because they have a schema for office, they expected those items to be there. What Brewer and Trains also find is that the participants don't remember the vast majority of the odd items in the room because these things did not fit the participant's schema. In terms of evaluation for this little study, it is lab-based after all, so we can maybe uh, look at it with a little bit of scepticism, but this is a real-world context. You are often asked to remember things, whether it be for revision, for exams, or if it might be something a bit more sinister, maybe you're asked to do a, an interview for the police, something like that. So this is lab-based, but it's a real-world context, so we can maybe give it a few merit points for that. One thing we can control for, however, in this experiment is participant variables. The participants who do this study might be very, very good at memory. They might have an incredible memory. They might be, for example, taxi drivers or they might be memory champions. We don't know anything about them. So maybe they just remember things because they're very good at memory. We can maybe go the other way as well. Maybe they don't remember seeing things because they don't have a very good short-term memory. So participant variables come in here. We can maybe say, well, maybe it was because of the office schema or maybe it was just down to the participants themselves. We don't know. That should say uh, cognitive up there. Sorry, apologies for that, guys. But this is the evaluation for the cognitive um, approach here. So in terms of positive, um, the schema theory is relevant and it seems to be quite useful as well. Humans don't normally have this idea of shelves in their mind that they go to and select a memory from. Rather, they link up ideas in their head in terms of context, in terms of meaning, as we know from from. from from some previous research. So it seems to be relevant and it seems to be quite useful as well. Another positive is this has a huge application to other areas. For example, eyewitness testimony. A later video that we watch on uh, Loftus and Palmer's experiment will show that schema might influence 
how we have viewed very, very important um, scenarios. A few different things to say in terms of negatives for this. Long-term memory, not like a computer hard drive in terms of size. For example, the computer I'm working on just now, I can see how much uh, space it's got. It's got two terabytes of space. And once that reaches capacity, I can't put anything else in. The long-term memory doesn't seem to have a capacity, or if it does, it is absolutely gigantic, much bigger than a computer ever would be. So we maybe can't quite make that analogy, analogy just yet. Second thing, memories are not recalled in computers the same way as in humans. If you ask your computer to recall a file, it does a quick search through the system and brings it up. Humans don't do that. Humans run memory searches with a regard for meaning. So in terms of restaurant, if I ask you to recall a restaurant, it's not as if you have a file for restaurant there, but you have a meaning of restaurant inside your head. So all these different ideas start to combine and then they come to the front and that's your idea of memory. So the two aren't roughly speaking the same. Last thing, there's a little bit of doubt in Brown, Brewer and Train's research here. Pejdek and his colleagues in 1989, very good year, um, have a look at Brewer and Train's research and what they find is that the inconsistent items, that is the skull and the brain and all the weird stuff, they're actually better recalled than all the stuff that should be in the office schema. So what they conclude that this is due to more attention being given to the items that seems surprising or unusual. So either way, it differs from our expectation that what we remember is due to our schema. So maybe there is some kind of doubt we can cast here on uh, Brewer and Train's research, maybe. Key concepts, there's only one here, schema. If you can understand, explain, and maybe give a bit of evidence as to what schema are, then you'd be off to an absolute winner for the cognitive approach. So thanks very much guys, that is a very brief rundown of the cognitive approach into psychology. Next video, into memory sorry, next video we'll be looking at memory models. We'll start off by looking at the multi-store next time. So that's a nice little bit of psychology to have a look at. Until then guys, have a lovely, lovely day and we'll see you again later. Cheers.